right, good morning, everyone. We are going to start. Um, I am Rakaya Yerby, Symposium Chair and Co-Activity Director of this program. And I would like to welcome you to the third annual Law Medicine Symposium on Healthcare Disparities, um, particularly um, as caused by racial bias. Before I begin, I want to thank a couple of people. If I can get my slides going. Okay, there we go. Um, let me check and see before you go. Okay. Now, well, as we uh, play with the slides, um, as you see, a lot of people work very hard to make this <coughs> possible, and I just want to take time to thank them for all their hard work. I'd also like to thank Tron Compton Ingle, David Franklin Wright, and all those who have helped um, on this presentation. As we start this conference, I want to ensure that we are on the same page, and so I'm just going to provide a brief introduction with definitions that we are going to be using throughout the day, um, and then turn it over to Vincent Coe, who is going to introduce our <coughs> keynote speaker. So in terms of health disparities, we have seen uh, the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, in particular Title VI, which prohibits racial bias in the healthcare system. Now, our keynote speaker will talk about the advances we have made since the passage of Title VI, and throughout the day, everybody else is going to focus on how racial bias continues in the healthcare system and sometimes outside the healthcare system to cause health disparities. And so we will be using this definition of health disparities that includes um, the racial bias, right? That there are health disparities that are linked to racial bias. And you can see this also discussed in the 2002 Institute of Medicine report, which as you see focuses on uh, disparity and includes discrimination, bias, stereotyping, and uncertainty. And that is what we are going to focus on in the next two days. Now often people say racial discrimination. Uh, in the legal academy um, and in courts, we use the term racial bias. They are the same. But what does that include? And it includes both disparate treatment, which are intentional actions, right? The signs of white, colored only, and disparate impact discrimination. And usually that's more in terms of we have neutral policies that just affect people differently. There are three types of racial bias. One is interpersonal bias. So we see prejudice in interactions between individuals, and this can be between healthcare providers and their patients. It could be just patients experiencing racial bias that affects their health. And there is a new um, study of that actually called epigenetics, where you can see that stress can change you at a cellular level, and you can pass those changes on to your children. Institutional racial bias looks at more of these neutral policies, um, even though some will argue they're not. Dr. Alan Sager actually is going to present uh, tomorrow on an example of this, where from 1937 through 2006, that hospital closures have been linked to race, more so than anything else. Um, and so we begin to ask this question, how can we address these neutral policies uh, that have a disproportionate effect on one particular group? Finally, structural interpersonal bias, which is how we structure our healthcare system. And so why do we make quality and access to healthcare based on ability to pay versus need? It causes our system, our healthcare system, to be one of the poorest in quality um, and also one of the ones that spends the most. And so, 
What are the conference objectives? We hope at the end of these two days that we will identify at least one approach to combat each type of racial bias, interpersonal, institutional, structural, that you will obtain an understanding of Title VI of the, health, the legal system and how it works in terms of health care, and that we will have an action plan to move forward, that we will use this action plan in Cleveland, in Ohio, and perhaps across the nation to finally put an end to racial bias in health care so that 50 years from now, we will not be here discussing how we still have health disparities. And that ends just my introductory remarks. I'm going to bring up Vincent Cole, who is a third year law student and vice president of BALSA, and he will introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. David Barton Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yerby. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. As you said, I'm Vincent Coe, third year law student here. I'm at the, this is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Uh, David Barton Smith who's a research professor in the Center for Health Equality in the Department of Health Management and Policy, and also a emeritus professor in the Risk uh, Insurance and Healthcare Management Department in the Fox School of Business and Management at Temple University. Uh, Dr. Smith uh, received his PhD in Health Services Research from the University of Michigan. Um, he was awarded the 1995 Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy uh, Research Investigator Award for research on the history and legacy of the racial segregation of healthcare and continues to do research write and give lectures on this topic at medical and law schools across the country. Uh, Dr. Smith is also uh, author, co-author of about five books on the uh, organization of health services, the most recent being Healthcare Divided, Race and the uh, Healing of a Nation, um, which was released by the University of Michigan Press in 1999, and Reinventing Care, Assisted Living in the New York City Vanderbilt Press in 2003. Uh, Dr. Smith has also authored and co-authored more than 35 journal articles, um, for regarding health service research related um, and in addition he's served as a consultant in more than 20 community health assessment and health improvement projects with hospital systems and community coalitions in all regions of the nation. You'll help me introduce Professor uh, Dr. Robert Barton Smith. Wow, it's, uh, I, I'm really excited to be here, uh, and uh, uh, particularly uh, to uh, listen to all the, the, the rich uh, resources uh, that I have had the chance either to, to work with or to benefit from that are going to be presenting uh, here uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm also, um, I've, I've admired all their work uh, it's great uh, to be a, a part of this particular program. Uh, they are really sort of uh, uh, the conductors and the engineers of an underground railroad for the 21st century uh, that are going to lead us uh, in the words of the uh, great migration from the South that began uh, a century ago uh, to bloom in uh, the warmth of uh, other suns. And I know right now you're probably thinking maybe we should all migrate back, <laughs> uh, given the winter that we've had here. Uh, but um, that's um, uh, probably beside the point. What, I, what I'm going to try and do is set the stage uh, for all the wonderful resources you're going to be exposed to today uh, and tomorrow uh, in, in, in terms of this particular topic by talking about uh, what happened in 1964 where, uh, and uh, in 1965 and 66, where the Civil Rights Act, and particularly Title VI, uh, for the first time was on a collision course uh, uh, with uh, a new program uh, that was going to provide uh, massive funding for the healthcare system uh, in the Medicare uh, program that was going to be implemented in July of 19, 
66. Um, this was a huge change, and the Medicare program was really <coughs> the first test of the most controversial piece of that civil rights bill, which had to do with uh, how the federal government spent its money. I want to tell you what happened, and I want to sort of talk a little bit about what I see as the lessons in that story. Uh, I want to give you a little personal background here. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, this is uh, uh, me and my, my twin brother, and the one on the, uh, on, on, on the, uh, the one that looks worried is the one that's anticipating uh, doing the presentation today <laughs> at the session. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in 1961, my, my twin uh, uh, brother went on, on a bus ride uh, to Jackson, Mississippi uh, with uh, some friends. And um, on, um, uh, on uh, uh, this particular day, uh, on August 4, uh, he was uh, sentenced and sent uh, to the Parchment State Penitentiary in Mississippi uh, for a six-month sentence uh, for sitting in the wrong waiting room in the bus station in Jackson, Mississippi. And on that day, uh, this is the most widely circulated birth certificate uh, in the history of the world, uh, on that day, uh, uh, Barack Obama uh, was born, and we now have him as president, and we can sort of uh, appreciate uh, some of the changes that have taken place in those 50 years. Uh, my brother was struck by those changes uh, several years ago when the governor of Mississippi invited all the people that had, he had uh, the, go the former governor had jailed uh, in the Parchment State Pen Penitentiary back for a banquet and a celebration and an apology uh, for uh, their treatment and also uh, to uh, sort of mark the beginning of a new tourist attraction in Mississippi uh, called the Freedom Trail. Now, some of you are probably thinking, my God, they're gonna turn it into Disney World. You know? <laughs> and, and, and some of the people that were Freedom Riders said, yeah, no, no, you're not gonna do that to us. Uh, but others said, look, there's a whole generation of people that have completely forgotten these struggles, and we need to provide them as much uh, of a way to understand those changes and the change that still need to happen. Uh, and so, okay, let them have this Disney World, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll support it and uh, participate in terms of making sure it gets going. Okay, now, one of the areas that, uh, that has faded most from memory is what healthcare was like before the passage of the Civil Rights Act and before the beginning of the Medicare program. Incidentally, I don't really distinguish those two laws. You know, the Medicare was really the gift of the Civil Rights Movement. It was passed as a result of the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the endorsement of that act that led to Johnson's landslide victory uh, in, uh, in the election of 1964. Uh, this is Grady Memorial Hospital. It's one of the few things we have left, physical symbol of what existed uh, uh, before in this country in terms of healthcare. There are two twin towers and they have separate Emergency rooms, separate cafeterias, separate uh, waiting rooms, uh, separate operating rooms, and separate patient uh, care rooms in wards. Uh, it was completed in 1954, and all of you probably in the law school know what also happened in 1954. It said that you, the, the idea in constructing this building is we're gonna build an airtight defense from separate but equal. We're gonna create two twin towers and nobody can claim that one side is getting better care than the other guy said. Well, of course, best laid plans in healthcare as usual uh, go awry and just as this building was opening, uh, the ground decision uh, uh, came down 
And then, of course, there was going to be a looming collision between a healthcare system that was largely segregated by Jim Crow laws in the South and by uh, more informal de facto segregation uh, throughout the rest of this country. Um, and uh, first of all, the first defense in the, in the healthcare system is, well, we're not, we're not a public agency. We're not a, we're not, we're not a government thing. We're a private uh, organization. We're a voluntary hospital. We're a voluntary health system. Uh, uh, Brown doesn't apply to us. Sure, to, to the schools, but not to the health hospitals. Well, in a, in a decision, Simpkins versus Moses Cone in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, they said, no, you received Hilburton funds to construct. You were part of a Hilburton plan, a state plan, in terms of allocating those beds. Therefore, <coughs> you are an arm of the state. And the round decision applies to you. Uh, that decision then got pushed into the creation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act that was, uh, at that time, just beginning to be debated uh, in the Senate, uh, the longest filibuster in Senate history, and uh, that bill, uh, that particular section of the bill survived, and then within a year, the Medicare legislation was passed. And then the question came, well, what the hell do we do? How do we go about enforcing this legislation? And what had gone on in the past, uh, before uh, the passage of Medicare, was uh, um, a, a problem that uh, uh, just seemed like it wasn't going to go away. There was an immovable object. Public school desegregation had gone nowhere. Uh, in, the, in, in the South, there was massive uh, 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 objection to it, uh, resistance to it. Uh, in, uh, in the North, even after the passage of Title VI, one of the first efforts uh, to enforce it was in the city of Chicago, and Mayor Daley, uh, you know, confronted uh, Johnson, and Johnson caved and said, okay, just give them the money uh, and let them promise uh, to uh, sort of look into the problem of the de facto segregation that was going on in the schools there. Uh, there were total hospital intransigence. A uh, whole series of complaints were lodged after passage of Title VI uh, for hospitals that received uh, Hilburton funding and nothing had happened. Nobody could figure out what to do. Furthermore, there was no staff to do anything about it. And there was congressional uh, intransigence as well. Remember that it took a, uh, the longest uh, uh, filibuster in Senate history to pass this bill, and those that have been on the wrong side were all on the appropriations committee and said, okay, you can have your bill, uh, but we'll be damned if we're gonna provide you uh, the resources to enforce it. Okay, well, that's a real immovable object. Hospitals are hard to move. They're private institutions, uh, and they were built that way so that uh, outside uh, governments, government pressures would not uh, affect them. Um, okay, well, that immovable object met an irresistible force. That was the grassroots civil rights movement uh, that was at high, uh, uh, high water mark, and they basically said to Johnson, and to the uh, Johnson's administration, we're not going to let you get away with paper compliance. We're not going to let you uh, give the South, which at that time said, well, let people choose which ward uh, they go to. Let them make, uh, make that choice. We dare them. <laughs> we dare the black patients in the South to choose to go on to the white ward. We'll, we'll just give freedom of choice to everybody. Uh, and, uh, and the civil rights movement said, no, no, this is a government program. We are all in this together. Uh, you can't separate us. You can't give us that kind of choice because that uh, uh, just doesn't work. Okay, well, 
You had an office of equal health opportunity that was created in the public health service. And it was set up in February 1966. Okay, that's just four months uh, before uh, the implementation of Medicare. It had a staff of five. Okay? There are five staff. There's no way to get additional staff. No. You know, you're gonna get, you're gonna go to that those same appropriations committees and get them. You give your special appropriation to staff something they're against anyway. No way. Okay. There's seven thousand hospitals that have to be certified by Title VI by uh, July 1, 1966. Uh, what do you do? Well, some of you are thinking, well, if I was in that situation. Uh, I would take a stiff drink, <laughs> crawl into bed, and turn the electric blanket up to nine. <laughs> um, well, let me tell you what they did. Secretary Gardner at that time uh, said, okay, HEW is now a civil rights organization. Part of the job of every employee in health, education, and welfare is civil rights. Therefore, uh, we're going to assign people from every operating agency to be a responsible, uh, to be uh, transferred, to be a part of this team that's going to uh, enforce the Civil Rights Act in the hospitals. And we're going to ask for volunteers first. And we don't get volunteers, we're gonna draft a certain number of people from each of the operating agencies. And the director of those agencies uh, can say no, uh, have to approve that that person is irreplaceable and they can't, they can't, can't let go of them, otherwise they get to go and participate in this. Now what happens when you get volunteers? Well, you get volunteers that are already involved in the civil rights movement. They're already out there uh, picketing on the weekends uh, uh, to integrate swimming pools, integrate lunch counters, and all that kind of stuff. This is like, my God, I get to do this on my day job. Okay, so you got a very committed group of people that were really a part of the civil rights movement. They just happened to have government jobs, uh, day jobs. You ought, they also recruited 60 medical students. They said, we'll give you a summer job. Come and help us integrate all the hospitals in the country. We've interviewed some of those students and they, quite frankly, had no idea what they were getting in for. They, but that, I, 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 I can't find out yet. Uh, mostly Northern School, I suspect. Uh, however, they did get a lot of people from uh, the Social Security Administration, the regional office in the South, and they proved to be the most effective. In fact, one of them went into a hospital and uh, met with the board in the uh, hospital in Mississippi, and he said, um, I'm not going to pass you. Your souls are not pure. I will come back when they are. This is a Baptist hospital. <laughs> and everybody knew what he meant. And they made sure the next time he came back, their souls were pure. Okay. There was regulatory, uh, basically what happened was regulatory capture. The people that trained and guided and provided the intelligence effort was the civil rights movement. They staffed it. Uh, all the people that had been protesting in Secretary Gardner's office uh, six, uh, three months before were now consultants to this project and they basically took it over. So I think it's the, the only time uh, that there has been uh, capture, regulatory capture, uh, rather than by the industry, uh, by a, a movement that wanted to, uh, to transform that industry. Okay, well it worked. 3,000 hospitals were brought into compliance in four months, and not just paper compliance. They not only removed the signs, they said, you all have to sit together. And we're gonna make sure of that, and we're not 
We may remove the signs on the doors, but we're gonna fix those doors so you only can come in one door and you go out the other door and nobody can sort of self-segregate themselves uh, uh, in any way. Okay, what happened after that? Well, I had a gradual elimination of all the gross disparities in terms of access to care. There was an iron law in this country that said that um, you can only, uh, uh, the, the amount of care you receive is, is related to the amount of income you have and inversely related to your means. And now that law was uh, turned on its head. We had a dramatic reduction in disparities between 1965 and 80. Uh, people forget this now because things are kind of stuck in the mud uh, since then, uh, but there were dramatic uh, reductions, specifically related to access to hospitals in terms of <coughs> fatality, in auto fatalities and south, but in general, in terms of reduction of premature deaths. Okay, well, what didn't happen? Uh, well, the system only changes enough to quiet trouble, uh, and I'm gonna tell you how it, it tried to quiet trouble. We have, uh, in, Jim, in, in Jim, Jim Crow segregation, we had vertical integ uh, integration, but horizontal segregation. As long as you're standing, uh, people could line up together, but if they sat, they had to be segregated, and God help them if they were in a horizontal in a bed. Okay, uh, in terms of the governor's strategy, we had the low-hanging fruit strategy which said, let's go for the hospitals first and we'll get to the nursing homes and we'll get to the private medical practice later. Private medical practice was specifically exempted from Title VI. Okay, well, you know what happened. We now have the lowest length of stay uh, uh, at any hospitals in the world and the, the, the lowest uh, number of beds per thousand population of any developed country in the world. Uh, and we've had uh, dramatic uh, uh, growth in terms of private accommodations in hospitals, which have <coughs> added to costs, and uh, expanding capacity in the suburban ring. And we created a huge, set, completely separate uh, nursing home sector uh, that has uh, over, uh, over one million beds were built in a decade uh, that is completely separate from the acute care se sector. Uh, and notice that all of these changes contribute to racial and economic disparities. Not only do these changes contribute to economic disparities, to a certain degree, they resegregate care. Okay. Okay, now, I mean, just very briefly, let me give you what the, what, 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 what the lessons were. And the major lesson is the golden rule. The golden rule is those that have the money rule. And you have the money, you should rule. And what we've done too much to uh, healthcare is delegate that uh, to the industry. We've delegated that uh, to, in terms of quality control to the Joint Commission, and in terms of payment uh, to the fiscal intermediaries, the Blue Cross plans, and the cost base. Uh, reimbursement, all that stuff that created a huge <coughs> increase in cost. It's the only place where we had any kind of government presence, federal control, federal gatekeeping control was in Title VI. And you should remember that. We did a better job there uh, than they've done in terms of assuring quality and access. Okay, all the other things are things that other people are going to be talking about uh, in terms of data in terms of extending compliance to all providers, uh, in terms of need to boost the business case uh, uh, for compliance, and also, of course, the need uh, to uh, uh, revert, uh, some kind of rebirth of civil rights movement ethic, which may uh, be involved in the community needs assessment uh, uh, requirements that hospitals now have if they want to keep their tax exempt status. Okay. Well, and I know you're all sick and tired of being sick and tired, uh, but uh, uh, it's been 100 years, and uh, we're uh, still slowly mo moving towards justice. Thank you very much.
we are going to move to our first panel, and I'm going to bring up Dr. Raska, um, who is going to introduce the panelists. Um, and if the panelists can come up and take a seat, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce our very distinguished uh, first panel. Um, I will uh, introduce them in the order that they will be presenting. Um, the, uh, each uh, panelist will have 15 minutes to present, and then when um, all the presentations are done, we'll have 10 minutes for questions and discussion. Um, our first presenter, presenter will be Professor Rakaya Yerby, um, who has also introduced herself. She's our Associate Director of the Law Medicine Center and uh, the person that coordinated this whole effort. So um, thanks to Rakaya. Um, uh, after uh, Professor uh, Yerby, um, we will have Mr. Chip Allen. Um, he currently serves as the first health equity coordinator at the Ohio Department of Health. Um, in this position, Mr. Allen is responsible for developing agency-wide goals, objectives, and strategies to eliminate health disparities and promote health equity for all Ohio residents. Additionally, Mr. Allen works in partnership with national public health agencies, other state cabinet level agencies, and a variety of public health programs to target services to minority populations, uh, to measure performance, and to assess outcomes. Then we'll, we will have um, Dr. Roland J. Thorpe, Jr., who's an assistant professor in the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the director of the Program for Research on Men's Health in the Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions. Dr. Thorpe's program of research focuses on understanding the ideology of disparities in functional and health status of community-dwelling adults across the life course in three interrelated areas. First, social factors, mainly race and SES, socioeconomic status, uh, that influence functional and health outcomes in middle to late life. Second, race, segregation, and health outcomes. And third, men's health. Finally, um, our last panelist will be Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones, um, who is research director on social determinants of health and equity in the Division of Adult and Community Health in the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Jones is a family physician and epidemiologist whose work focuses on the impacts of racism on the health and well-being of the nation. As a methodologist, she has developed new methods for comparing full distributions of data rather than means or proportions in order to investigate population level risk factors and propose population level interventions. As a social epidemiologist, her work on race associated differences in health outcomes goes beyond documenting those differences to vigorously investigating the structural causes of the differences. As a teacher, her allegories on race and racism illuminate topics that are otherwise difficult for many Americans to understand or discuss. She hopes through her work to initiate a national conversation on racism that will eventually lead to a national campaign against racism. Thank you so much for all our panelists.
Good morning. I am filling in for a panelist who, because of an unforeseen conflict, was not able to be here. So bear with me. I just found that out yesterday around 4 p.m. Um, so my uh, talk will just focus on uh, interpersonal racial bias and how it affects health disparities. I apologize to other panelists if I go over some of the material that you are planning to speak on, but it was an eight hour journey. So, um, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. noted that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And as we take a look at our healthcare system, um, since the Civil War, it has been separate and unequal health care. And I start there because that's when the dialogue began in the U.S. about whether we would actually move to um, a health care system that would cover everyone or whether we would move to private insurance. And one of the main arguments against uh, moving to a system right, that covered everyone was again this question about who would be seen who would be provided health care, and race played a major role. And so even though, as Dr. David Barton-Smith uh, <coughs> noted, that since Title VI we have removed the signs of colored and white only, that it still remains separate and unequal. And I, let me give you just a few examples. In the 1970s, some hospitals and nursing homes remained racially segregated by floor room and staff. In the 1980s, African Americans were denied admission to nursing homes that provided excellent quality of care. In the 1990s, studies found that physicians believed minority patients were unintelligent, which kept physicians from recommending medically appropriate cardiac catheterization, curative surgery for early stage lung cancer, and antibiotics to treat pneumonia. In the 2000s, physicians' racial bias prevented them from providing African Americans with medically necessary treatments for heart attacks. And I've highlighted some of those studies, and in fact, um, some of the people on the panels today and tomorrow are authors of those studies and will go into further what it means to be separate and unequal um, in this day and age in healthcare. And so I'm going to provide you just with Again, a definition of interpersonal racial bias, the same one I did in the intro. Talk about how it affects physician-patient relationships, the health effects of this racial bias, and some solutions, and then I will conclude. As I said, interpersonal racial bias is a conscious and or unconscious use of racial prejudice um, between individuals. And when I say that and I discuss um, some of the data. I want it to be clear that we all hold bias. Um, people have gone on, there's a Harvard uh, medical website where you can check your own biases. And so when we talk about this racial bias, this unconscious and conscious, I have specifically noted that it does not matter about the race of the physician, because you see that bias held by African Americans when they're treating African Americans, okay? And so it's not just that, that we as a society hold a pro-white bias. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't diversify our, our workforce, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but let me start by going through the Shulman study and some of these studies and just note that when we're talking about physicians, we're talking about physicians of every race, ethnicity, gender holding this bias, okay? In 1999, one of the first um, studies by a physician um, to investigate physicians' perceptions of patients. And what they found is that African-American patients were less likely to be referred for cardiac catheterization than Caucasians. Uh, while African-American women were significantly less likely to be referred for treatment compared to Caucasian males. And this was in part because of a physician's per perception of African-Americans as less intelligent, less willing to comply, uh, regardless if information was provided that was contrary to these uh, perceptions. 
There was in 2000 an article by Dr. Neil Common um, who actually reviewed his own bias and the bias of his colleagues and the fact that he was treating a particularly African-American male and could not get the care for that uh, patient that he actually needed. And so what he started to do was to place calls and introduce the patient before he showed up so that physicians would understand that they needed to provide the best care um, to this patient. I'm gonna skip over the 2000 and 2006 um, a Dr. Van Ryan study uh, and Burke study, um, but again, some of this same information, um, and this will be uh, discussed hopefully in um, the next panel. So what are some of the health effects? The health effects is that African Americans receive less than the recommended care, and that uh, it leads to increased disability and mortality. And why I'm focusing on the differences between African Americans, African Americans and Caucasians is because that is the highest uh, the health disparity that we see. We've only begun to track the differences between Latinos and Asians um, in this country. And so that's why I'm focusing particularly on, in this case. And what you see is that um, in various areas, whether it be related um, to heart conditions, lung cancer, um, to pneumonia, to uh, even treatment of children, that we've seen that uh, research has shown us that physician bias is linked to a difference in treatment that is not, uh, that is not supported by difference in um, disease status, it's not education, it's not socioeconomic status. And in fact, I'm gonna highlight on one, the resection for lung cancer because it pulls out a different thing that I want you to focus on. Um, so uh, there's a disparity in resection for lung cancer medical treatment and survival rates. And this is because African Americans tend to uh, receive their treatment and lower quality health care. Now some may say that that is because they don't live in areas where there are high quality hospitals. And recent research has shown that that is not the case. What they found is that African Americans actually live closer to high quality hospitals but they are being shipped to the lower quality facilities. And part of that is not only because of this issue about physician bias, but it's also because that the primary care doctors that treat African Americans do not have access to these high quality hospitals, um, and sometimes they are not um, certified to the same extent as um, uh, as physicians treating other patients. So what are some of the solutions? Uh, one is to diversify healthcare providers. Uh, one of the issues we see in, um, in the patient-physician relationship, when there's a difference in the race, then there is a difference in the relationship. So what research has shown us is that there is less um, opportunities for the patient to be involved in their care. There's less questioning, um, there's less discretion. And so diversifying the providers um, is key. But we need to educate all providers and not just assume that by diversifying that we are fixing the issue because we all have uh, biases that we hold. And so we need to educate healthcare providers about their bias. Um, and train them to treat each patient as an individual and not part of a group. And we also need to increase healthcare providers' access to high quality specialists and hospitals, which again goes to the proposition that everybody should be treated equally. Um, so in conclusion, I just want to read this quote from the Secretary of HHS from 1964. Our urgent responsibility is to assure adequate health care to all Americans. I think that none would deny that consideration of race or color has no place with regards to the ailing body or the healing hand. Fifty years later, we have not fulfilled this promise, nor have we fulfilled the promise of Title VI. 
The time has come to put an end to racial bias in healthcare by treating all patients as human beings who deserve the right to equal access to quality healthcare regardless of race. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of the Howard Department of Health, our director and the staff, I um, am proud to be here to be a part of this symposium. It's also good to be back home. Even, um, as a, even though I live in Columbus, I grew up in Cleveland, and I spent uh, most of my summers on this campus. I grew up on this campus um, as a product of the Upward Bound program. And so I used to walk past this law school uh, and growing up and wondering what happened in this building, and <laughs> I know. Um, but it's good to be back. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, very briefly is to really talk about these issues on a state level, to think <coughs> about policies and how policy really relates to health equity. I want to talk about the issue that place really does matter in terms of not only how well you live, but uh, how long you live and then think about the role of healthcare providers in the pursuit of health equity. Now, I'm gonna to try to do that in 15 minutes. I'm gonna set this up for you. I'm going to show you a series of slides that actually have some very specific data on where we are. And then I want you to think about place and how where you live and who you are really impacts um, how, how where you live, particularly in terms of race. Now we talked about health disparities um, I, I appreciate the uh, definition that was provided. I'm not gonna spend time with that. But I really wanna also talk about health inequity. Because from a population health standpoint, uh, disparities really turn into inequities when they are the result of a systematic and unjust distribution of what we call social determinants of health. And of course, the social determinants of health, housing, uh, economic and social relationships, transportation, all of those things that we need in an abundance to stay healthy. I don't care who you are, if you don't have good housing, if you don't have a living wage, the health that you thought you had or the good health that you thought you had, you will not have it anymore. So I wanna be real clear with that. Um, I'm also a part of the uh, Ohio Statewide Health Disparities Collaborative. If you would go to our site, you would see um, this, um, one of these slides. And the reason why I actually show this is because when we think about health disparities and health inequities and we actually understand what those definitions mean, we tend to think about these problems um, with a particular health problem in mind. So maybe it's HIV and AIDS, or maybe it's heart disease and stroke. We tend to segment our understanding of health disparities based on diseases when actually health disparities impact all of us, particularly in terms of a lifespan. And so one of the things we've been trying to do in terms of population health, and also for our colleagues who are working in the healthcare industry, is to think about disparities in terms of not how they just impact someone who's middle aged, but what happens when you're actually even born? How does health disparities impact you and your family um, before you come into the world and then once you're here throughout your lifespan? If we do not begin to start framing it in that way, we'll miss some opportunities to do some things very differently. So with that in mind, uh, one of the things we talked about is a life course perspective. Uh, Dr. Michael Liu um, uh, has talked about that. And we think about birth outcomes. And the reason why I focus on that, because when you're in public health school, the first thing they tell you is if you want to assess the health of any community, who do you look at? You look at the infants. You look at how well they're surviving. And if you have a problem with infants, actually being able to survive within the first year of life. It really points to some other issues that need to be addressed within the community. And the reason why we talk about it in terms of a life course perspective, because we are seeing that these poor birth outcomes are not necessarily the result of a lack of access to care, but it, it's really the result of what happens to people, particularly women, even particularly women of color, throughout their lifetime, particularly when they experience racism. 
and the impact of racism on their health and not only the, their health and the health of their unborn children. So when we think about this, how does that play out? Well, if you would go to Ohio Department of Health, they would tell you that prematurity um, or preterm birth is the number one killer of um, uh, babies in the first year of life. It talks about how much it costs, not only in terms of the economic cost, but also the cost in terms of families and communities. And so if we think that in mind, if we, if we think about that, what does that, what does that look like in Ohio? Or basically, what does that look like here? So what I did is I took data from our Ohio Department of Health, the vital statistics, the birth records. I took that data. I actually combined it with uh, geographic information system software and market research data. And I actually was able then to look at um, what does the birth outcome look like for Calvin County, where we are now. So what I'm going to just set you up very quickly is to look at, this is Calvin County, and you see this map uh, based on census tracts. So I didn't do it by zip code. Census tracts, for those of you who may not know, uh, define regions of land that actually have between 1,500 and 8,000 people with the optimal size of 4,000. The reason why we talk about census tracts is because you can compare one census tract to the other as opposed to zip codes, which are only designed for the efficient delivery of mail. So when you look at that, <laughs> that that's the risk where they are. Now, we're going to actually, um, when, when you look at this, and I know Dr. Thorpe is going to talk about that, if you look at this map, the areas in blue in terms of um, low birth weight actually have the best birth outcomes. Less than 6% of all births between 2010 and 2013 were low birth weight. If you see an area in red, those census tracts have the worst birth outcomes in terms of low birth weight. 23 to 28% of all infants born in those census tracts are low birth weight. Similarly, if you look at uh, the hash marks, uh, the best birth outcomes, and I have something else to show that. Why is that? Okay. Um, the, in terms of the hash marks, when you actually see a red pattern with that kind of check mark pattern, uh, we actually see some of the worst uh, birth outcomes um, in the city. And actually, you can go down to very low levels of geography and actually see specific neighborhoods where this is really a problem. So what does this matter? Uh, again, and that's my slide somehow got mixed up, but that's what I wanted to show you before. This is how we interpret those maps. Why is it important? <coughs> well, in order to really see the impact of this and how it affects Calvin County, what I did is I actually took all of those areas at the worst birth outcomes, I combined them and gave them one geography. I did the same thing for the best birth outcome because in order to compare how this impacts us, particularly in terms of race, you have to be able to combine it to see a signal or pattern. And if you do that, you would actually see that in those areas that we have the worst birth outcomes, if we could combine them, they would have a population of 71% African American. In the areas that have the best birth outcomes, they would be 73% white. And then you compare that to Calgary County. And automatically you start to see a pattern. Now, we talked about folks in terms of health. CDC came out with a report in, I think, 2009, and then they did it again in 2013. And what they said is, if you really want to predict health disparities, poor health outcomes, there are things that you look at. You look at education. You look at poverty. You look at income. If we were to look at it in terms of Cobb County, where we are now, for the areas that had these birth outcomes, and the hot spots, you would look at uh, high school, no diploma, almost 18% of the adults 25 and over would have some high school, no diploma. Compare that to 5% in the areas that actually had the best birth outcomes, and then look at that in terms of college county. If you would look at it in terms of the income differential by race, you would see stark differences. And the reason why I'm saying this is because if you see problems in terms of racial bias and unequal treatment in healthcare, they have their origins outside of the community where people live. Amen. So that's what we have to figure out. It's not one problem or the other. They are interconnected. We just have to be able to see how that happens. The other thing is unemployment. If we were to take all those census tracts that had the worst uh, birth outcomes and combine them if they were one area, we would see an unemployment rate of 20 
7.38% versus 7 for Tim for the crew spot and then 8% for Congress County. Now let's put this into perspective. 8% unemployment put us in the worst economic situation since the Great Depression, right? So if 8% is bad for the country, what is 20% bad? What does that look like for these communities? And now again, we can take each one of those census tracts and tease them out a little bit different, but you have to be able to combine them together to see the real impact of the problem. I only have a few more minutes. I know I'm gonna get the sign, so I'm gonna keep going fast, all right? <laughs> uh, the other thing I wanna talk about is, oh, I'm going time, okay, uh, five minutes. Uh, if you look at just in terms of home ownership, in terms of those hot spots, those cool spots, best friends out there in Chicago County, 67% of the folks rent versus it's almost turned out around in terms of the cool spots, 71% of those folks are owned and 28% uh, rent. Why is that important? Because we're talking about home ownership, we're talking about institutional wealth, I'm sorry, uh, family wealth and generational wealth. Even with the economic downturn in terms of housing, I don't care what kind of house you had, you had a house, you had an asset, a lost asset, but you had something to hold on to. What happens if you don't have that in the beginning? What can you really build from? Now, we all know the inequities and disparities are unnatural. They're caused by humans and perpetuated by policies. So what are some of the solutions to this? Um, before that, you have to really create the proper mindset to address this. And then you have to incorporate structural strategies to address these issues. And what do I mean by that? One of the things that we do at the Ohio Department of Health is we give out grants almost half a billion dollars a year. So one of the things that we did at the health department is we actually came up with a process where that every grant that comes out of our agency now has to have a health equity focus. Not only that, they have to come by my office for me to be able to provide a consultation on how that works. It's not, now I'm not the health equity police, all right? So they don't necessarily have to take all of my suggestions. But it would be a good idea if they did, okay? And most of the time they do. But the reason why that's important is because we're talking about a resource, a public resource <coughs> that is designed to protect public health, but we have to have the proper mindset. The other thing that I think um, that we need to think about, which is I think the new frontier in policy development, is the rulemaking process. The legislature creates laws that sometimes have to be implemented through state agencies. One of the things that I'm suggesting to my colleagues is that we have to be able to have a health equity lens in terms of how rules are developed in our agencies. <coughs> rules determine everything from nursing home development or to, uh, sewage. And so if you think about the legislature having the authority to create laws, but then you have these state agencies that must implement them, we need to begin to start asking questions about whether or not those laws are designed with health equity in mind. And it comes to this whole issue of um, facial neutrality. Now for those of you all who are lawyers, you know what that means probably better than I do, I'm sure. But if a law, when it's designed, is supposed to be neutral on its face, that it it's supposed to be able to be applied equally and not discriminate, what happens if you are trying to address an issue like disparities that's in and of itself caused by inequality. Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to think about ways in terms of the structural piece. If we have a law, and it's a good law, we want to make it better. We have to begin to ask the type of questions that will allow us to say, this law is going to uh, maybe, uh, well, we know that it's not right or it's not fair to discriminate uh, against folks because of their religion, sexual orientation status, but it happens. How do we actually make sure that our laws and our procedures actually support what we really intend to do? So um, I'm going to stop now to uh, give my <coughs> colleagues an opportunity to share some information, <coughs> and hopefully we'll get a chance to dialogue a little later. Thank you.
Okay, good, up. good morning. First of all, I want to say thank you to uh, Dr. Yerby and her staff for uh, hosting this event. And I'm just honored to be on this uh, distinguished panel and to be here to engage in this conversation today. Um, I want to take a few moments to uh, talk about, um, I was telling Chip when he walked by, I said, I might as well not do my talk. You covered most of the stuff. <laughs> and what you didn't cover, Dr. Yerby covered. So, But I want to take a few moments to talk about um, risky places and unhealthy spaces. This, uh, the notion of segregation and how it impacts health disparities. So uh, my talk is organized as I'm gonna give you a brief history today of segregation and how it came about in the United States. And then I'll talk about two theories that suggest how segregation might impact health disparities. And then uh, talk about um, some of the, give you some data and talk about some of the problems we have in trying to understand and advance in health disparities research with regard to uh, national data and then share some highlights with you of a project that I directed a couple years ago and some of the findings. So segregation is one of the uh, one of the key determinants of health that we have that uh, has started to receive more attention in the public health arena in the last two decades but sociologists have been and other social scientists have been actually talking about uh, and describing race-based and um, socioeconomically based segregation for a number of years. So when I talk about segregation, I mean it's a compositional and a spatial distribution of two or more groups in a geographical area. And the geographical area is specific, that I'll be talking about today is specific track that Chip Allen, uh, Dr. Chip Allen so eloquently defined in his talk. Um, today I'm gonna, there is segregation in other um, Hispanics and other groups, but today I'm focusing on black-white segregation because that is uh, largely uh, unique to the United States. All right, and then so starting out with the history, the brief history lesson, segregation, black-white segregation in the United States has been encompassed in three distinct periods. The first period we have is from 1890 to 1940. So this is a period where we have this great migration. We have a large number of um, rural, people are blacks in the south moving to the north. And this was a result of changes in agricultural climate down south, as well as the manual labor market force up north. Um, this, this racial composition of blacks living in the north, it increased from 23% in 1890 to 43% in uh, 1940. The point I wanna also highlight here is that this, uh, where, where the blacks ended up living was largely driven by uh, newcomers coming in and the newcomers were actually, the blacks that were newcomers were actually living in places where other blacks was. So the, the key point here in this period to remember is that there was a choice largely by blacks to live here as opposed to a limited structural uh, limitation. And this was just a study by uh, sociologist W.B. Du Bois in, 18, uh, in 1899, the Philadelphia Negro, he had, he, this is the first time he detailed, or first time it was detailed that there's differences in uh, black mark race differences in segregation. So moving on tonight, the, the period between 1940 and 1970, we still have this continued expansion of this migration from the uh, uh, south to the north, but now there's a number of these cities, a number of blacks from the south move into the north and racial tensions are starting to emerge. And as a result of these racial tensions starting to emerge, then there has, there is, uh, scholars call this notion of collection, uh, collective action racism, whereby now housing markets are starting to be manipulated by law and they're coming up with these resident restrictive covenants and over acts by whites to keep themselves separated from blacks. And the, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1968 uh, supposedly prohibited, the, well, it does prohibit discrimination in housing sales, and in theory, it stopped the collective action of racism. But we know today that is this, this de facto segregation still remains. This is a study, this is the first study in 1950 by um, Alfred Yanker, Dr. Alfred Yanker, um, who looked at and observed the differences in New York and infant mortality rates for black and white babies. And he noticed that there was an increased concentration of mortality rate, the higher mortality rate was increased in the, in, among blacks in neighborhoods where mothers' residence was increased. I'm sorry. He noticed that the empty, infant mortality rate for black and white babies increased as the concentration of blacks in the mother's neighborhood increased. And this was the, uh, purportedly the first time in public health 
that this notion of residential segregation and race um, had occurred. So moving to the third distinct area from 1970 to now, we see that uh, in, in the and in the 1960s that residential segregation in the United States was at its highest peak, about 68%. And since 1970 and since the uh, enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, we have seen a decline, albeit minimal. We have seen a decline over the last four or five decades. Um, and this is really largely the decline as a result of black families moving to all previously white neighborhoods. Okay, but nonetheless, we still have these enduring effects of residential segregation in terms of isolation and concentrated poverty. And these effects remain. Some areas where middle class black families have integrated into white neighborhoods, but then you also have what has happened is that you have poor black families. They have become isolated and they're stuck in these resource poor areas. Um, and so th it's, it's these resource poor areas that are the, uh, that create and reduce some of these uh, health disparities that we, that we see today. <coughs> and so most recently, um, Dr. David Williams and Topeka College have suggested, have put out some work in early 2000s suggesting that segregation should be considered a fundamental cause of residential, I mean, of racial health disparities. This is just a picture of showing you the, uh, from 2000 to 2010, the black-white um, segregation the United States from 2000 to 2010 census, we see on the national level, we have a modest decrease. It was 60% in, uh, around 60% in 2000, and it decreased to, I think the number is 57% at the national level, and this is how it's distributed across the United States with the least uh, being in the West, the least area of black-white segregation resides in the Western region. And this is how you're situated in the Cleveland area, the greater Cleveland area, how whites and blacks are distributed with regard to housing in the Cleveland area. There you see the blue areas is where the segregation, the dark blue areas is where the segregation has really occurred. Um, so I, and I, I love to talk about this in the uh, discussion segment, and especially here Dr. Allen's comments of what areas of town these really are. And I'm sure there's some red line and other forces that goes on that keep, that keeps and maintain this segregation here. So that was just a brief overview, very, very brief overview of how, of how segregation has emerged in the United States. Um, I wanna turn and talk about now, how does it, this segregation or how can it impact health disparities? And there are two theories that are put forth. The first one is this risk exposure theory. It basically says that this segregation create these health risk profiles in communities where African Americans and other minorities live. Typically they lead, uh, this, the, those people live and have greater exposure to environmental toxins, and they are in targeted areas where a lot of hazardous products are being sold, illegal drugs, alcohol, and you know, as imagine, com as you can imagine, combine this with the concentrated poverty, it can lead to high crime and low quality housing, and a much more stressful environment to live in. The second theory is this theory of resource deprivation. Um, this is where you, uh, where it simply states that. Segregation <laughs> creates this differential access to health support and resources. So there is less for, uh, available full service restaurants and supermarkets with availability of fresh fruits and vegetables is limited in these resource deprived areas. And there's a lower chance, as Dr. Yerby talked about earlier, lower chance of access to high quality care in that uh, high quality care and there are fewer health, uh, health clinics. So now I wanna talk about the, uh, about segregation and how it advances uh, and how, and health disparities. So the United States government, they collect this data every year and they produce this report called the National uh, Health of the United States. Um, and they do a number of things with the health of the United uh, States. They uh, track and monitor trends, identify health problems, and they also see if they're meeting the needs of the Healthy 2020 objectives. And one of the key things they do here now is to study health disparities. But I argue that uh, the information that they put out may be inaccurate with regard to studying health disparities. And, and one reason why I argue that it may be incorrect is because the, they fail to account for the health risk exposures of the resource deprivation that, uh, that, segregation, has, uh, that segregation creates. And two problems that, well, one major problem that we have with looking at these data and understanding health disparities research is that when we think about segregation and health disparities, Race and ethnic disparities are confounded with uh, segregation. Um, so your race status determines really in which way you experience America. 
Um, oftentimes, minorities and blacks live in different geographically distinct uh, areas. And then these areas um, have different environmental and social risk exposure that we don't really account for in our, when, we look at these, when we look at these data. That's not accounted for in the data that's produced in the health of the United States of America. Um, so it is quite possible that, um, I believe it's quite possible that race differences observed in national data could be due to the uh, dip race differences that's driven by where one lives and their place, and that the national data is not accounted for that. So um, back in 2003, uh, the Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solution, we, uh, okay, we put together a study and we, had, we developed a study called Explore Health Disparities and Integrated Community Study. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to say, hey, what does, uh, we, what does the nature of health disparities look like when we uh, examine this when people live under similar social and health risk exposure? And what we did, we did a nationwide assessment of the 2000 census that met these three criteria. And of the 66,438 census tracts in the United States, only 425 of those met the criteria. Right. Only 425 is integrated. We wanted to say, we wanted to look at integrated communities. So when folks living together in these similar social and environmental risks, do we still see the same patterns that are produced in the health of the United States, um, and, and the health of the United States continent? And so, um, we were fortunate enough to have two census tracts right about 15 minutes from our office in Southwest Baltimore. And so our first census tract, as you imagine, to imagine was in Southwest Baltimore. Um, this was a low socioeconomic community. Uh, we went in and we used a community-based participatory uh, approach. We went to the community, we shared them what we were trying to do and trying to accomplish, and we held meetings. We, and we really went in and we got to know and got involved in the community. We were successful enough, we went door to door, knocking on door, door to door, ended up having face to face interviews, and we were um, able to recruit 1,489 people. And so when we recruited those 1,489 people, we had several, uh, we asked them several questions, and so what we did was we recruited those, and then we ran some data analysis, and the data analysis we ran, we had, these are several different outcomes, health outcomes, and we asked the same questions that the, uh, National Health Energy Survey asked to facilitate <coughs> comparison of them. And here's the data here for the national data, and here's the data for our study in Southwest Baltimore. These are looking at the, um, the odds of, of uh, black white differences and the odds of reporting these conditions. And we notice uh, in here, if one is included in this confidence interval, that means they're, they're not significant, that blacks and whites have the same odds of reporting your health outcomes. So we see in all of the national data that, um, well, in the diabetes, obesity, and hypertension, that blacks have a higher odds of reporting hypertension, obesity, diabetes than whites. Um, and we see in eating, in our data set, that accounts for the social and environmental conditions in which people live. We don't see, when we put this, the race difference is not here in diabetes and obesity, and it's significantly reduced in hypertension. And then here in Edict, we see that African Americans are more likely to use health services in our sample than whites, whereas there's no race difference in the health services used in the national data. So these data, we uh, wrote a paper and put it in health, uh, submitted a paper to Health Affairs. It got relatively a lot of attention a couple years ago, and we concluded that race differences in social environments do explain a meaningful portion of disparities that you typically find in in these national data. And one reason, uh, how much time do I have? Okay, so one, one, three minutes, okay. Well, and, and one reason why, I just wanna take a moment to say one reason why we found, we believe a lot of those differences went away, it was because of the worst health profile of the whites. This was an urban area, hear me, the worst health profile of the whites. Inner city whites health profile was worse than the inner city blacks. And that's why I saw the, that's why the race differences went away. What we typically think in the health disparities in the public health is always the, the blacks that are pathologic. And that's not, that's not the case. So when you put inner city whites and inner city blacks in the same environment, the health profile of whites now looks typically to the health profile of blacks. So there are a few caveats to this study. We, uh, 
We did not look at uh, race difference in occupation exposure. This was only two census tracts in a low income urban community. We don't know if these findings will hold in a higher SES group or any other racial ethnic uh, compared to any other racial ethnic groups to whites. So I like to close by saying that, you know, segregation, while it, uh, there are laws that have been enacted to uh, get rid of segregation, the, the, the enduring effects still remain today. Uh, this notion of place matters is very important. Neighborhoods impact the health and shape of our behaviors. Where you live affects how you live. Um, it affects your jobs, it affects your uh, health and the homes. And the greatest impact, I think the greatest impact on health disparities is that we need to start addressing some of the systemic effects of health disparities. We need to start addressing those social determinants of health that Dr. Allen talked about earlier. And I think that is uh, a, an approach that we can use to start combating uh, health disparities. Thank you. Delighted to be here. I'd like to know what proportion of this audience, who's a lawyer in here? We're sort of getting that way. Okay, so really, and then what about the public health medical people? So about half and half, or some people are both. Hey. <laughs> okay, that gives me an idea about uh, what I'm bringing. I wanted to talk about racism, not even racial bias, but racism, and talking about racism in the public health medical sphere is a challenge. We're not there yet. It's still a struggle because when people look at data on racial health disparities, the default position still is that these have a biological basis, right? So my struggle within public health has been to shift that conversation and to identify racism as a fundamental cause of racial health disparities. So what I'm going to do today is just quickly provide a framing that I provide to the public health community, a def framing definition of racism, then a communication tool to help us in public health understand how racism could be a fundamental cause of racial health disparities, and then from the legal side, pre present a specific legal framework that could be an organizational tool for action. And at the end, I'm gonna race through some musings that are about the intersection between law, medicine, and public health and where we can go from here. So, what is racism? Here is my definition of racism. I start out by saying that it's a system. It's not an individual character flaw, it's not a personal moral failing, and it's not even a psychiatric illness, as some people have suggested. <laughs> but it's a system of power, a system of doing what? It's a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value, and on what basis is the opportunity structured, on what basis is value assigned. It's based on the social interpretation of how we look, which is what we call race in this country. So here in Cleveland, I'm clearly black. In some parts of Brazil, I'm clearly white. In South Africa, I'm clearly colored. Same appearance, social interpretation of that appearance in these three settings puts me into three different racial groups, and if I stayed in any of those settings long enough, my health outcome would probably take on that of the, of the group to which I was assigned, even though I'd have the same genes in all three places. What, is the, what are the impacts of this system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on race? Well, it unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, but it doesn't take long to recognize that every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage, so it also unfairly advantages other individuals and communities. And then whether or not it's you're in a group that's being unfairly disadvantaged or unfairly advantaged, this system is sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. So when we think about how we don't invest in the full excellent public education of all of our kids, because the blinders of racism make us think there's no genius in the barrios or the get ghettos or the reservations, or when we are complacent with the wholesale warehousing disproportionately of so many black and brown men in the prison system, or when we're not up in arms about the magnitude and the persistence of the health disparities. These are all ways in which the blinders of racism are sapping the strength of the whole society. Now, the, I talk not, um, you know, we for this symposium are using institutional racism, interpersonal racism, and structural racism. I, in the public health realm, have defined things that slightly overlap but slightly differ. 
So I am going to present three levels of racism and how I can talk about it in public health, institutionalized, personally mediated, and, in time, and internalized. I'm gonna just very quickly define them, flash up some examples, and then I want to share my communication tool, a story that helps people to understand. So institutionalized racism in my mind are all of those, it's that system, the structures, policies, practices, norms, and values that result in differential access to the good services and opportunities of society by race. This is how it manifests, differential access to all of these things. And when people look at this list, they say, well, Dr. Jones, housing, education, employment, income, why do you have those things on your list about institutionalized racism? Isn't that what we call social class? What are you talking about? Are you talking about social class or are you talking about racism? My response there is that it doesn't just so happen that people of color are overrepresented in poverty in this country while white people are overrepresented in wealth. That's not just a happenstance. But for each marginalized, stigmatized, oppressed group, there's been some initial historical injustice, which is now perpetuated by contemporary structural factors. I usually go on, on and on and about that, but you, I don't have time today. But when people ask me, am I talking about racism or am I talking about social class, I say that institutionalized racism, which includes those contemporary structural factors that are perpetuating historical injustices, institutionalized racism explains why we even see an association between social class and race. Before I leave this, I have to say that includes both symposium as institutional, that is <coughs> the acts of institutions, as well as structural racism. Both of them are combined in this thing, cult of omission acts of not doing, and very often it shows up as inaction in the face of need. The second level of racism, personally mediated racism, which in this seminar symposium setting we are calling interpersonal racism, but I call it personally mediated racism because I am still clear that racism is a system. So this is the system mediated through people. My definition is differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race and then differential actions based on those assumptions. That's what most people think of when they hear the word racism, the different idea, the prejudice, and the different action, the discrimination. And so when we talk about racial bias and racial discrimination, I sort of subset it as a part of racism. Examples of how this could impact you and your health. And um, like institutionalized racism, personally mediated racism can be through acts of doing as well as acts of not doing, but even more important, it can be unintentional as well as intentional. And you do not have to have intended to done something race, racist to have had a racist impact. So here we get to that legal notion and, and under what laws do you have to show intent versus just disparate impact. For internalized racism, my definition is acceptance by members of the stigmatized races of negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth. Of course, people in the, uh, you know, in the white majority also have internalized many a sense of entitlement. That's also internalized racism. But here, when we're thinking about the health impacts, I'm going to just talk about these. Self-devaluation, which often turns into fratricide. If you, you know, black on black, Latino, Latino crime, if you don't value yourself, you won't value somebody who looks just like you and just as soon as them as not, and all of these other things. And so this is something that we haven't explicitly talked about in the symposium yet today. It's about accepting the limitations to our own, quote, humanity, of the box into which we've been placed. Again, I could talk to you for days about this. But what I want to do now is illustrate these three levels of racism with a very quick communication tool, a Gartner's Tale allegory that I published 14 years ago and that has now wide currency who in this room has already heard the Gardner's Tale? Okay, so I'm gonna tell it really quickly, okay. <laughs> so uh, it's based on my own real experience, but we're not gonna talk about the real experience that gave me this insight. We are gonna start with a gardener, a gardener who has two flower boxes, one which she knows to have rich fertile soil, and one which she knows to have poor rocky soil. And she has seed for the same kind of flowers, except some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms and some of the seed is going to produce red blossoms, and this gardener prefers red over pink. So what does she do? She puts the red seed in the rich fertile soil and the pink seed in the poor rocky soil, and three weeks later, when she's looking at her flower boxes, it looks like completely different species of flowers have been planted, even though these were seed for the same kind of flowers. Because in that rich fertile soil, all of the seed has sprouted. The strong red seed has grown very tall and vigorous, but even the weak red seed has made it to a midland height. But in that poor rocky soil, the weak pink seed has died. So there are fewer plants in there. 
And even the strong pink seed has to struggle, struggle, struggle to make it to a middling height. And then those flowers go to seed. And the next year, the same thing happens. And then those flowers go to seed. And year after year after year, the same thing happens until finally 10 years later, the gardener is looking at her flower boxes and she says, I was right to prefer red over pink. So that first part, I'm gonna interrupt the story just for a moment to say that that first part illustrates how institutionalized racism works, where you had the initial historical insult of the separation of seed into the different types of soil, the contemporary structural factors of the flower boxes keeping the soil separate, and then through inaction in the face of need, perpetuation of the inequity. Take this story back up. Where is personally mediated racism in the garden? Well, the garden is looking at red flowers, loving them, looks at pink and says, oh, those flowers sure are scrawny and scraggly. So she plucks off the pink blossoms before they can even go to seed. Or she may notice that a pink seed has blown into the rich fertile soil, so she plucks it out before it can establish itself, some of the anti-affirmative action stuff. Where is the internalized racism in the garden? Well, red flowers are just living their lives, many of them not even understanding this and benefiting from enriched soil. Pink flowers looking over at red, loving red and wishing with all their hearts that they too could be red. And here come the bees, minding their business, collecting nectar, but pollinating at the same time. Here comes a bee into one of the pink flowers and to another pink flower and to this other pink flower who says, get away from me bee, don't bring me any of that pink pollen. I prefer the red because the pink flower has internalized that red is better than pink. So what do you do to set things right in the garden? Well, you could start by addressing the internalized racism. Go to the red pink flowers and say, pink is beautiful, power to the pink. Important, <laughs> important, but important intervention, but if you don't do anything to change the situation, it's not enough. You can deal with the personally mediated racism. You could have a conversation, or better yet, you could have a workplace multicultural workshop. For the garden. <laughs> it's all good, it's all good. And you say, Garda, would you please stop plucking those pink flowers? And maybe she will, and maybe she won't, but even if she does, it's not gonna change the situation in which they find themselves. I think if you really wanna set things right in the garden, you have to address the institutionalized racism. Break down the boxes and mix up the soil, or if you wanna keep separate boxes, it's all right too, although it makes it easier to continue segregating resources going further. But if you kept separate boxes, You'd have to enrich that poor rocky soil until it's as rich as the rich fertile soil. And when you do that, the pink flowers will flourish. You'll be looking at least as beautiful as the red. So they've been selected for survival and strength over generations. <laughs> when you do that, you will have also addressed the internalized racism. Pink won't be looking over at red wanting to be red. And maybe the personally mediated racism, racism, the original gardener may have to go to her grave preferring red over pink. But her children growing up and seeing the flowers would be beautiful, would not have that attitude. Now I'm going to race through the rest of my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> that story has been to illustrate these three levels, but I didn't yet talk about who is the gardener. It's the one I gave the power to decide, power to act, control of resources, which are the elements of self-determination. And clearly the gardener includes government, media, foundations, corporations, communities to the extent that they have self-determination, but whoever it is, dangerous when the gardener is alike with one group, I painted her red, that's why she prefers red over pink. Dangerous when she's not concerned with equity, when she can look at her flower boxes and think that her garden is beautiful because she's not even counting the pink flowers as part of the garden. And lots of questions and discussion we could have about the gardener's tale, but we are going on just to say that the most important thing, racism, this big thing, when you say the big word, when you don't say racial bias or racial discrimination, but you say racism, <laughs> that system, people feel defeated. But it is not a miasma, it is not a cloud that we can't get a handle on. It is a system with identifiable and addressable mechanisms in our structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. Where structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision making. Who's at the table and who's not. What's on the agenda, what's not. Policies are the written how of decision making. Practices and norms are the unwritten how of decision making. Maybe a little harder to get a hold of. And values are the why. And we don't talk about that, but that's the mindset that you were talking about there. So, very quickly. Who in this room has ever heard of ISA, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination? A few, more people in this room than in most audiences. Most people have never heard of this. What is it? It's an international anti-racism treaty adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1965. For those who don't know, do you think the US has signed this treaty? <laughs> no, because what, like what? But yes, we did in 1966. <laughs> but the trick here is that we can sign all the treaties we want, but the Senate has to ratify a treaty before it has force. So do you think the U.S. Senate has ratified this treaty? Yes, 1994. 28 years later, but yes. 
It means that we have treaty obligations to do right under the nine-page treaty as well as to do periodic reports. We are able to bundle our every two-year reports into bundles of six years. The second report was submitted in 2007, and we got concluding observations back from the committee that said, thank you, dear United States, for your report. We remain concerned about racial profiling, residential segregation, disproportionate incarceration, differential access to health care, the achievement gap in education, on and on and on. Indeed, in paragraph 43, they say, dear United States, you need to let your people know about the existence of this treaty. So every time I talk, I do my part. But now, <laughs> the current status is that the third report, which was due in 2011, was finally submitted in 2013. And it's here. It is a 69-page report. Very interesting reading. 69 pages describing to an international audience the measures that we, the United States, are doing to address racial discrimination. And a lot of it starts with, we have laws that prohibit discrimination in here. Here is our current status where we observe differences, and here is how we are seeking redress. These are the number of cases that we saw. This is the amount of money and all like that. Very interesting reading. The part on health, specific to us, is in, are, is in paragraphs 133 to 142. So take a look at that. It's going to be considered in August by the next, the 85th session of the committee. And people can go. Have you gone, Bernelia? You yeah, have to come to And testifying. And people can submit parallel reports. So here's an action idea already. Okay. But now, musings, very quick. Acts of commission versus acts of omission. Something that we need to think about, even in terms of a legal stance. Inaction in the face of need, even harder to get a legal handle on. Intent versus impact, lots of people talk about that. Civil rights within the US context, human rights, including this international anti-racism treaty, and people's rights, which get beyond the individual and talk about the rights of communities. So something we can talk about. Law, which in my mind, a lot of times is about recall. <coughs> Medicine, which is about treatment, and public health, which is about prevention, and then what about the role of law in prevention to create healthy structures, policies, practices, norms, and values? How can we reframe there? And what about decision-making processes, racism, and all of this structures, policies, practices, norms, and values as aspects of decision-making versus individual decisions, which gets me to the use of the term racism versus racial bias? And I think it's an important distinct distinction that we might need to think about. <coughs> Finally, we keep talking about prima facie neutrality, laws which are neutral on their face, but which are applied in settings of inherited disadvantage or inherited advantage will not result in equity, and I will close with this last slide, if I may. That achieving health equity, I have a three-part definition. Health equity, what it is, is assurance of the conditions for optimal health for all people. It's a process, not an outcome. Assurance, an ongoing process. Achieving health equity requires these three things, at least. Valuing all individuals and populations equally, the mindset. Recognizing and rectifying historical injustices, including how they manifest in residential segregation, and naming history in all things. Whenever you come to any table, you need to ask, how did it come this way? And then rectify that, and then providing resources according to need. Because I think that health disparities, the differences in outcomes, will be eliminated when health equity is achieved. Thank you. questions and discussions. So we're going to do about 10 minutes and then I will uh, direct you in terms of the breakout sessions, which is just a name in the sense that you're not moving from here, okay? <laughs> but that you are communing with your neighbors to begin the work uh, that will lead us to the action plan um, at the end. So let me open it to questions. Are there any questions? Yes, and if you're going to um, ask a question, please go down to the microphone um, and state who you are uh, because we are webcasting this and so we want people to be able to hear you.
right there. Right there. Um, I agree with you that education is important, but I would extend it even beyond health education because health is not created within the health realm. Health is created by where you live, by your educational status, by transportation options, job opportunities, and the like. So when I have been asked how would I spend health money, I would just invest it in the education and in the strong social security of all children, but not education specifically on health matters. Just uh, education as a gateway to opportunity, and education actually as a reflection of the opportunities in your community so far. So education is important as a predictor for both of those reasons. Okay, anybody else on the panel? Okay, yes. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Kristen Gates. I'm a third year family medicine resident um, I actually go to residency in Connecticut. And my question is this, um, part of my passion, part of my passion is um, as physicians, the voices on this issue are few and often silent. Um, and I have actually found most of my mentors outside of active practicing physicians and wanted to ask, how do you, uh, or what advice you would give to someone who is a physician who wants to take a broader viewpoint on these topics and, and provide a voice, even from within it, um, in the medicine field itself? I have a start, okay. So actually you're describing my whole path, my life path. <laughs> so I mean, you can stay in medicine and address these issues, but one of my frustrations was treating patients and then sending them back to the same conditions that were making them sick. So one thing you can do as a physician still in practice is to recognize that your interventions do not have to be limited to writing a prescription or m health advice, but you can uh, be active in terms of uh, tenant organizing or you know, letting your patients be aware of health conditions and, and what they can do to organize themselves. Then you will find yourself as a physician also in many decision-making tables. And so you can bring your, your knowledge, you have to get involved outside of the health sector and maybe get on the school board or you know, go and testify to the legislature. You need to, on your off hours, be advocating and in your on hours, have an expanded vision of what is a legitimate health intervention. Uh, yes. Uh, the other thing, in terms of Affordable Care Act, one of the things that is a requirement now is the whole pay for performance. So we're, not, we're in a situation now where physicians are not going to be reimbursed just based on the volume of patients. They're going to be reimbursed in part based on the outcome. And so one of the things that you have at your advantage as uh, a healthcare provider are your electronic health records and medical records. That will allow you to actually look at your entire patient population and begin to stratify outcomes of what's happening to your <coughs> patients by race and ethnicity. So within that, you now have tools or you will be required to use those types of tools to be able to talk about how is health care provided um, in a quality manner is based on individuals with the same health condition. Uh, and so now you have a way of actually being able to use data and also this whole issue of cost containment um, to be able to say why is it that we are providing in some cases a lower quality of care for a population of, of folks maybe based on race or based on some other issues, that then you can begin to argue and say, if we want to stay in business, if we want to be, remain relevant, 
we have to begin to start using the information that's available to us to make a difference because when data has been um, lost through these paper records, it's very difficult to be able to make the arguments. So I think we have more to it, but you Mr. Fuller. The one, thing, the one thing I'll say is that you also want to think about when you're encountering the patients, find out about some of the social determinants of health that you can, uh, what is their housing like, things like that. So when I go to the doctor, no one ever asks me about my housing. They may ask me how many years of education I have, but none of my housing information. So if you keep, keep that in mind as well, because that housing is a big, big piece in employment, and those are two key pieces that will lead you to, uh, that can provide <coughs> key critical information. And I wanted to add on, stimulated by um, their comments, there is also a way of organizing care that's, it, it's old, it's called community-oriented primary care, where a health <coughs> practice would take responsibility for the health and well-being of a geographically defined community. Mm -hmm. So not just taking good, excellent care of the people who move into the door, but also addressing unmet need and even unrecognized needs. And it was done in cooperation with the community, community leaders, and it often involved the hiring, training, and deployment of community health workers. It's a model that <coughs> allows the health practice to also address social determinants of health. I could talk to you for days about that, but community-oriented primary care. Now, in the new Affordable Care Act, they have something called patient-centered yeah, medical yeah, homes. Yeah. That is not exactly the same thing because it's patient-centered medical homes. But people at the Prevention Institute in California have suggested that we expand that idea to community-centered health homes, and then they have said that that kind of notion is the same as community-oriented primary care. So just Google that, and if you can get involved in setting up COPT practices, that would be a great step. Okay, Professor Randall. Uh, yeah, my name is Professor Vanilla Randall. If you're under 60, you may call me either Professor Randall or Ms. Randall. Really don't care. Um, I, I just want to kind of uh, respond to the suggestion by the doctor about educating people, because I think that's an important distinction that we need to make as we think about solutions because that solution that was recommended goes to the individual in, 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 in changing individual behavior. If you're trying to deal with institutional and systemic racism, that then that, as a former public health nurse, I can testify to the idea that working with individuals is important, but working with individuals don't change systems. And so that if we're going to look for system changes, we've got to look for system solutions, um, and not to minimize the importance of individual behavior change, but just to make sure that as we talk in our group that we are focused on system and institutional as opposed to individual. Okay. Um, okay, we have time for two more questions. So there will be one down there, uh, one up here, and then um, I'm going to go to the woman and you can come down here and then we're going to do our breakout groups and definitely continue this discussion in the breakout groups. So yes, what is your question? And just let me stop you one second. And who are you? <laughs> Tell us who you are. That's, you raise a very good question. Uh, dissemination is one of the big things that I think that we, uh, as, a, as a health community, need to work more rigorously on. Uh, what we've done in Baltimore is that Baltimore, if you know anything about the geography of Baltimore, is set up in neighborhoods, and I think Cleveland is something similar to that. And most neighborhoods have community leaders and stakeholders there. And what, ba what the city of Baltimore has started to do is to use those stakeholders in the in each of those communities to get information out. There are universities in Baltimore that have university radios that actually uh, 
the community listens to and the health information is put out through there. And the, the, when I talk to, go around the country talking to men, men tell me that, that the way they get their health information is largely through radio. So I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm a big proponent of pushing some health information through the uh, radio, and, but I'd like to hear from other people on the panel, particularly you in Ohio. Well, one of the things, the uh, Ohio Commission on Minority Health, um, I think out of all the state agencies does it even better than my agency, the health department, the state health department, does one of the best jobs of engaging local community organizations to address health issues. So, for example, they're right now doing their uh, minority health kickoff. If you go to their website, you will actually be able to see a number of different community-based organizations that are doing some excellent work on addressing these issues. And they're not health departments necessarily, but they are community-based organizations. So I think that they exist. Um, and, but I also, um, in terms of information dissemination, one of the things that I've been heavily involved in at the state level is helping many of our local communities understand how to use market research data. So for example, the clothes you wear, the things you read, it is not just a function of your good taste, but it's <laughs> also a function of what marketers understand about you. And so one of the things we've been doing is being able to help not only our state agencies, but our local communities, giving them market research data to say, for example, if I want to reach those households that I know have the worst birth outcomes, I'll do a market research analysis because one of the things that marketers understand about us is they understand how to segment. You can have individuals within the same census tract, but you might have five different segments based on lifestyle, <coughs> urbanistic, and purchasing behavior. And so one of the things we're doing is giving communities more information that while radio may be good and cute, you might be best reaching people through text messages or through social media. And so there are a number of different ways that based on the 21st century, the way that we used to communicate with folks has become very sophisticated, but it's not sophisticated if you really know how to structure your message. It's okay, not. I'm gonna uh, cut it off just so we can get that one last question. Good morning. Um, my name is Tracy Carter and I'm with Summa Health System in Akron, Ohio. We operate a Center for Health Equity. And one of the uh, questions I have for all of you, we talked a lot about the data, the issues and concerns, but from your travels, is there a community across the nation that has done a great job fusing housing, uh, jobs, healthcare, education together to actually tackle the issue and demonstrate outcomes? I'll start. I think Seattle's trying to do uh, uh, its bit. I think Seattle hasn't, hasn't finished, but but they're, they're on the way because they had, so, so what was the brother's name? He, he then went to labor or something? But anyway, they had at the leadership, people across leadership who are working together across housing and education and health and all of that. They have a 14 point uh, social determinants of health checklist that any new uh, laws and regulations would all have to go past. And so, Seattle. Yeah. 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 And I would also say Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota, oh, yeah. the yeah. Department of Health, um, they're doing some, some very good work in terms of um, even their church groups are addressing racism as a fundamental cause of disparities. And so, um, uh, and I, the name will come to me, but you can reach into the uh, Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, Gene Ayers, the assistant commissioner, um, is doing some very good work in engaging the community uh, in, in, in that space. And I want to add two more. Boston, the, pub yeah. the health department, has done anti-racism training with the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, which is based in New Orleans. Shout out to them. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and all of their trainings are half health department people, half community, so they are doing that. And Flint, Michigan, which had one of the REACH grants, Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health, focused on infant mortality by addressing racism, and they saw a significant drop in their infant mortality rate. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> to all of our panelists. Now what we're going to do is to get into groups and because the room is not filled up, I'm gonna kind of direct you to groups um, in a second. And what I want you to begin to do is to identify five health disparities, uh, whether that be infant mortality, breast cancer, lung cancer, um, and you're gonna get forms 
of this and begin to focus on how the healthcare system has created this disparity. Okay, and so in terms of uh, breast cancer, and there will be a slide that will be up to give you an example, and I use breast cancer. And so it's this question about breast cancer, uh, why is, do we have an increased mortality rate in African Americans? Well, one, it's because sometimes there are not enough institutions in the communities for people to get checkups. And as uh, we close more and more clinics because we don't want people to have abortion, that moves the clinics out of people's neighborhoods to actually receive um, care. And so that's what I want you to begin to do, to um, create a list within your group of five disparities and then pick out one disparity that you are going to work with today and if you return tomorrow to begin to discuss how or how the healthcare system causes this disparity. The next breakout session we're going to really focus in on racial discrimination, racial bias, how it causes the disparity and begin to think of ways that we can come up with solutions to address this disparity. Okay, and as I said, a slide will go up which will just show you an example. Um, you're going to get uh, one sheet per group where you should write your name so I can, we can know who you are as well as do the work. And I have provided the definitions that we are using within this conference to guide you. Okay, yes. Are we supposed to, in this first session, only restrict our analysis to the healthcare system or can we talk about how society is causing that system? And so for this, I just want you to focus on health care, okay? Uh, because as you uh, noted quite right often, right, when we look at the data, there's lots of talk about social determinants. We need more work, but we don't really talk about how the healthcare system perpetuates these problems. And so I want you to focus on that. Okay, yes. Do we have to focus on a disease when we start focus on a group? That's fine. That's fine, just as long as you take it through. Okay, and so I'm going to sort of put you in groups right now, and then you're going to get your sheets. We're going to come back together um, in about 25 minutes so we can stay on time. And I would like uh, just to give an example from a couple of groups, and I'll write it on. Um, this board so that we can kind of, it will guide us through the rest of the day, okay? Okay, thank you. So this side, you're all going to be one group, okay? Um, so if you can move, you'll be one group. Um, we'll say this is group one, okay? Please put your group number on the actual sheet um, so we can know who you are. Um, Matt, 